So bringing you back to that formula of highest revenue at the lowest cost, which is, you know, the fundamental heart of making, you know, successful, feasible multifamily development deals. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, Johnny Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you are enjoying this show and getting some great feedback, some good insights, tell us about it and leave us a rating and review. It helps us and it also helps other investors find this show and get some of the great insights that you're getting as well. And if you haven't done so, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. we got a great show with a returning guest, Mr. Scott Choppin. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Scott Choppin is the founder of Urban Pacific Group of Companies back in 2000. Since then, his company has brought over 1,700 units of affordable housing to communities throughout the Western United States. Now, the Choppin family has been in real estate development in Long Beach since 1960, and that includes highlighting developments of Long Beach World Trade Center and the 293 unit City Place residential development in downtown Long Beach. Let's welcome to the show, Scott Choppin. Hey, John. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scott, it's good to get you back on the show. For those folks who did not hear our previous episode, uh, we'll certainly link to that in our show notes. But why don't you give people a two-minute background on who you are? Sure. Um, so from your intro, you hear I have a family background in real estate development. So I you know, discovered or, or came to the industry you know, through that background. But basically, for my entire career, I have been in the real estate development business, developing ground up multifamily apartments, different versions of that market rate, affordable housing. So I spent several years in industry, worked for companies like Coffin and Broad, uh, their multi-housing group, building a, a tax credit finance affordable housing. I worked for a company called Saris Regis Group doing market rate multifamily in, in Orange County in Southern California. And then in in uh, twenty the year two thousand now like twenty almost twenty four years in uh, next month will be twenty four years John um, I founded Urban Pacific to pursue niche oriented contrarian and you know uncommon real estate development methodologies and that in the early years was infill development think urban housing in two thousand two thousand one two thousand two when urban housing wasn't a thing at least not a mainstream thing in the development industry. And then, you know, through to about 2016, we did just your pretty standard set of, you know, stack flat, multifamily ground up stuff throughout Southern California. Uh, we had an office for a while in Texas. Uh, we've been operative in Denver. So all over the Western United States, sort of in a, in a general sense. Uh, we were up in Portland for a while as well. Um, about 2017, we totally pivoted our entire company's focus and mission and pivoted into purely focused on workforce housing, which we're going to talk more about today. And basically, since that time, we have developed an innovative townhouse product um, and have, and have re really built our entire operation to be focused on the mission of delivering workforce housing to middle-income families, um, you know, in Southern California, and then, you know, soon to be California and the nation. And then more recently, we've uh, put together a whole capital management platforms. So think like private equity funds that are also themselves dedicated to finance the equity of our workforce housing development. So we're vertically integrated, you know, development, construction, capital, um, operations, you know, we don't do property management, but, you know, we're basically, you know, vertically integrated development and fund management company uh, focused on this workforce housing that we'll talk more about today. I love it, man. You talked about really growing up in the industry, right? Having a family background, 
you know, in this development space. So you kind of grew up being exposed to it. And this is what you were doing really since you started your career. Uh, and you really took a, an approach with your company uh, to focus more on kind of the, the niche aspects of it, you know, mm -hmm. infield development, you know, doing some, some niche, some ground up developments. And now you're really mm -hmm. focused on workforce housing. And that's where, you know, uh, the, the firm is focused today, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about where you've taken Urban Pacific Group to where it is today, you know, the thing that you'd start talking about was, again, workforce housing. I know that term may be familiar to a number of our listeners, but there may be some, you know, uh, maybe some myths or some misguided information about what workforce housing actually is. Can you start by actually defining workforce housing? Yeah, no, great question. We'd spend a lot of time describing what is workforce housing. So, the way I think about it, so if, if we look at my background, where I came in my career track, so I started working at Coffin and Broad Multi-Housing Group, and we did tax credit, finance, government subsidized affordable housing, or what I call true affordable housing, or some people call it big A affordable, right? And that's, you know, purely government subsidized at or below 60% of median income. It is for families and individuals that are, you know, not in poverty, but that includes those folks. But, you know, anybody who's you know, low or, or lower income, right? Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have, you know, what I'd call luxury multifamily apartment product, right? It's, you know, a core, core plus type product. It's, you know, sexy. It's got a beautiful pool and, you know, lounges out by the pool and, you know, hookah room and, you know, whatever, all the, all the goodies, all the, all the sexiness of a downtown living lifestyle, right? Those are the two spectrums. And so the way I think of, afford, of workforce housing, and I use that term differentiated from affordable housing because I want to always draw the distinction. What we do really sits in between those two categories of true affordable and luxury, right? And so this is, you know, has different ways that we can think of it. But the, the bottom line is what we want to do is we want to serve middle income working class families predominantly is our focus, but it could include individuals and roommates, right? People that are making too much money. In other words, they make too much money to qualify for the true affordable, right? They're above 60% of median income, let's say. But on the other end of the spectrum, they may not afford the sexy high rise in downtown Long Beach or downtown LA or wherever, you know, you get those kind of, you know, projects built, right? Or, and their families. And this is a key differentiator, right? So if you're a young person, you know, you can live anywhere in a one bedroom or studio unit. And then we can talk about income and affordability and that kind of thing later about that. But that's your lifestyle. And then there's lots of apartment product, new construction apartments that are serving that, right? There's tons of that. In fact, that's the majority of what's delivered over the last 10 years, let's say even up to, you know, stuff that's finishing now. What hasn't been served is, is families, think multi-generational families, or it would be roommate groups that live in this in-between world, right? Where their incomes don't satisfy the luxury, but they are overqualified for the true affordable. And so what we want to do is deliver privately financed workforce housing that serves these working class folks, again, with the predominant focus on families. Um, but of course, we're, you know, if we get roommate groups that, you know, fit this category, we're, we're certainly, you know, renting to those folks as well. But you could think of it as a space in the middle. Now, uh, we probably talked about this originally, but there's a terminology that people have heard called missing middle, right? And that's sort of applied to this workforce housing, middle income category. But missing middle really is a is an architectural distinction, an architectural term uh, developed by an architectural firm that basically you know, called out middle density housing. So if you got a house on one end and you got the high rise, you know, stack flat apartment building, this basically would be like a townhouse or some middle density product. And that is us. In fact, our, our townhomes are called urban townhouse. That's a name we've given them. And ours is our three story, five bedroom, four bathroom townhouse unit built sort of row home style, meaning attached and either multiple units and in individual buildings with multiple buildings in a project. But also the way I've thought about it is it's middle income, right? So it's in between the affordable and the luxury, right? That's middle income. It's in between a house and a stacked flat, right? So it's middle density, middle, you know, product type, right? Um, and then the other way to think of it is it's basically, it's sort of like a middle lifestyle, right? So in other words, 
you know, you've got your, your individual single younger couple that lives urban, right? And then maybe on the other end, you've got your true, you know, what I call the American dream. You know, it's a family that owns a house or rents a house and they've got the white picket fence in the backyard and, you know, the American dream, right? And so we're serving a product that's sort of a middle category product that basically delivers the experience of living in your own space, your own home, even if it's in the terms of a format of a larger project. The, the tagline I created, John, is basically it's designed and built to rent, but it lives like a home. So all three of those categories fall under my definition of workforce housing. And you're right. You know, some people I was just reading, uh, I do a lot of article research, you know, every every couple of days. You know, I'm always looking for new trends in workforce housing. Like I've saved these terms in my my new search. And what I'm starting to see now is that workforce housing and affordable housing as terms are starting to collapse really they were sorted together at some point. They sort of separated for a while. And then I'm watching them recollapse because when I like, you know, one of the, one of the big trends is in these ski mountain towns, think like Vail and Telluride and other, you know, Park City in Utah. Um, they're, they're having a tough time. They've always had a tough time having housing that was affordable to their workforce that works on, on, on the resort. Right. And that'd be, you know, anybody who works there. And what's interesting is they call it workforce housing, right? In the new in the news, you know, in the article, the 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 person writes about it, right? The reporter writes about it. But when you really look at what it's serving, the income categories it's serving, it really is true affordable, right? Now maybe different sources of money to pay for that affordability because you have to buy down the rents and that kind of thing. I think what's happening, John, is I think that workforce housing is a more palatable word for politicians, think city councils and you know, if you're in Telluride or Vail, and I'm not picking on those towns specifically, this is any resort mountain town has this issue. They don't really want to take care of this issue. I think it's become such a hardcore, you know, like politically sensitive issue that they're sort of having to do it. And so I think what ends up doing is developers like me show up and we're not active in any of these towns and we call it workforce housing, although it really is true affordable in the way that I define it. So I'm watching this sort of, you know, collapse back together from a, from a definitional standpoint. Man, Scott, you gave so much there, man. It's mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to break it down and recap it, but I have so yep. many places I want to go. First of all, you talked about understanding that <clears throat> workforce housing really sits in between. I love the way you describe it because it's, it's really clear to me you talked about affordable affordable housing being on one end of the spectrum mm -hmm. luxury housing being on the other end in the middle is really where workforce housing lies and to your point i think what happens for a lot of people we hear those terms affordable and workforce and they have become somewhat interchangeable i think people still understand there's a difference between workforce but they don't really understand fully what the difference is between workforce yeah. and affordable. And I think your point on thinking about our labor, you know, folks maybe aren't, don't have the money to buy their own home right now. Uh, but you know, they're working, they have jobs, they, you know, are not necessarily on government support or government subsidies. They just don't have the money to live in a luxurious right. lifestyle. So I think that's really helpful for, for people to wrap their heads around this. You talked about, cause I was going to actually ask you about funding of these projects, which we will get into, but you say, state it, these are privately financed projects that you're developing, you know, and I know one of the pushbacks we always see specifically with affordable housing, uh, but really anything that's not luxury is that it's hard to build these projects and make them profitable. So we're going to come right back to that. But yeah. the last point you touched on was kind of your approach to understanding that you're really balancing that build to rent approach while still providing really kind of a, a home like approach, you know, mm -hmm. serving that mid that missing middle from, you know, couples to, you know, maybe folks who own or rent a house, there's mm -hmm. a middle group there that there is a gap and really making sure that you're serving that group. Let's come back to the financing side for a second. <laughs> then I want to go back to kind of the product. Um, Cause one, I, I, I wrote down the word NIMBY as you were talking, right? Cause I think <laughs> you're spot on when yeah. I think of how this has happened, you know, you hear the word affordable and I think those antennas go off because very few people want to see affordable housing built in their community, right? Now, when you use workforce housing, that, that feels a bit more palatable for people. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of the rationale, right? And then, of course, being not in my backyard. So you have more of that pushback. And I think politically, that's been a way people have kind of worked around it. Um, but when you think about the the financing of this and 
again, I know everything I've read is that, hey, it's really difficult to build anything ground up that isn't, you know, luxury and make it profitable. How are you able to structure your deals and work around that? Yeah, great question. So we so fundamentally, we don't structure our deals from a capital structure standpoint any differently than any other developer. So the, the you know, the, the simple way I describe it is, and, and then this has actually changed, it used to be 75% debt, 25% equity, it's more like probably 6040 in this market where we are with lending and, you know, how lenders are approaching the marketplace. But, you know, basically, it's just, you know, one equity piece and one debt piece, right? Real simple. You've got two finance, you know, two, you know, capital, you know, structures come together and that that is the totality of the deal. Um, so um, for us, you know, it, when you subsidize housing with government money, you don't sort of pay too close of attention to what the bottom line is. And I'm paraphrasing and I'm generalizing, you know, big time. So there will be people who listen to this and go, oh, man, that's not right. But functionally, you're, when you get money from a from a government source, um, you know, the, the incentive to really figure out how to make the capital stack work really efficiently is to lessen. It's not none. It doesn't go to zero. Maybe in some nonprofit worlds, you know. It becomes, you know, like a like less of a concern, right? When you know you can go to the, you know, to the money trough at the city or the county or the state or the feds, then you know, if you you're not like you you're not required to solve the problem of cost efficiency, right? And so any market rate product it is that, right? And as you described, you know, the 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 standard uh response today is affordable housing. You just can't build it unless it's government subsidized. In fact, I, I follow a guy named Ken McElroy uh, on YouTube, um, you know, pretty well-known guy, probably seen him. And he said the other day, he goes like, I love affordable housing. I want to do it, but it doesn't work. Like you can't make it work. And I, and I thought I go, Oh no, I actually can, I can, you know, I'm just, I'm just me, you know, little old me doing my thing here. But what we figured out with this urban townhouse model that I described earlier. And so the answer really comes down to what is the product type that you're building physically and how does it work financially? And that's really the key. And I, I mentioned when we first talked this morning that we're still able to make deals pencil in this marketplace, although the vast majority of new construction multifamily that's trying to get started now, meaning they're trying to raise capital and trying to finance deals now, the deals don't underwrite, right? And the reason for that, and the reason, well, first I'll answer why ours works is basically we build a very specific product type. So I mentioned it's a five bedroom, four bathroom townhouse unit, right? I think, you know, People will react to the number of bedrooms and we'll we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. But it's really key that we build a three-story townhouse unit, five bedrooms, four bathrooms, two-car garage, you know, laundry room. That's what gives it the ability to live like a house that I mentioned before. But what's the interesting dynamic that we figured out about that unit type and the locations where we build it and the cost structures that it costs to build it is that we are building a very dense product but not in unit count, but yes, in bedroom count. In fact, uh, I was on the board of directors for the USC Lust Center. Richard Green is the executive director. And in a conversation I had with him, he brought it forth brilliantly. He goes, oh, you're not dense in units. You're dense in bedrooms. So every unit of ours has a five-bedroom setup, right? And so if you looked at a project of ours and maybe we're doing 10 units so we can do easy math, that's 50 bedrooms. Well, if you had, that's the same as 51 bedroom units, right, from a occupancy of people sleeping in a bed at night kind of, you know, thought process. But what our product does is because we're doing one kitchen for every five bedrooms, we're taking the most cost costly part of the project on a per square foot basis inside the unit in the vertical part of the building. And we're basically spreading that kitchen across five bedrooms. So if we had 10 units, you know, five bedrooms each, we'd have 10 kitchens. But if you had the same comparable bedroom count in one bedrooms. Well, now you have 50 kitchens. That makes sense. So we go from 10 kitchens to 50 kitchens. So the, the magic in part is by basically we're building more cost-effective space for the dollar spent to build it, right? So bedroom space and hallway space to serve those bedrooms is the most cost-efficient part of the entire building, right? Versus kitchens, the most expensive bathrooms a little less expensive right you know your laundry room and that kind of thing but your bedrooms like you know four walls and you know a window right go that's that's the thing so that's one factor of why it works right is we're basically we got a the most cost efficient 
you know, build process as a function of the product type, right? And we also stay in a three bedroom format or three story format, rather three story format. And what that is, that's the intersection, right? Of maximum income generation at the most minimal cost. In fact, I, on my Twitter account, if people want to go there, I, I hand wrote a graph that shows this equilibrium point. It's two curves, John, that come together and we're right at the point where those two cross. One curve is cost and one curve is revenue. And all apartment deals live and die on the ratio of cost and revenue. In fact, our favorite ratio is NOI to cost or untrended yield on cost, some people call it. And what we want to do is we want to maximize revenue and minimize cost and make that ratio this as you know as far apart as, as possible or the ratio as big as possible, right? Um, and so this product type, because of its format and the build cost and build efficiency is a function of the gross revenue it produces, we're very efficient there. Okay. Now the second part of it is what happens in this five bedroom format from a lifestyle and affordability standpoint from the family or roommates who live there is that basically the unit enables them to practice what I've termed economic sharing. That's a term I created sort of watching how these families live, right? And what that means is basically they're pooling their incomes together and they're paying in that pooled income all the costs of the family for housing, for utilities, for vehicles, all that kind of stuff, right? And this is true of any family. We're just basically giving a unit type that enables families who didn't have this lifestyle otherwise, or they were doing it in a different way, you know, to move into this unit, pool their incomes together in a multi-generational, multi-earner household is how we describe it. And, and it could be, and often is, and our mission focus is related families. So think grandparents, parents, adult kids, young kids, right? In-laws, maybe, you know, whatever you know, all related, right? Like we don't, we don't ever really put two unrelated families together. That's not something that we do. Uh, what we do is we have really related families that live in a family group. And then we have roommates. That's our two common one. We, we occasionally get corporate offers, you know, and a recent project in Long Beach, we had a local, you know, minor league soccer team who needed place for their players to stay while they were here overseas from, you know, wherever they're coming from. So we'll do that occasionally, but our mission focuses multi-gen families, but then we're still market-based development and fund management company. So we will rent to whoever is appropriate and underwrites correctly. Right. And so when people come together and, and do this economic sharing, what it ends up doing is each person's cost or each wage earner's cost is reduced marginally or or you know more than marginally to a point where that now makes their both their life more affordable given the income that that person earns and or allows them to earn the same and live a better life in a better unit brand new unit maybe you know better whatever that's more affordable they can afford a better life um because of but not making any more money right so the example I always use, John, is, you know, the media loves this. They go, oh, it takes, you know, I'm making these numbers up, $47 an hour for the average wage earner in California to afford a two-bedroom apartment. Let's just, you know, again, making that up, right? And that is true on the face of it, but what it does not do is any accommodation to how human beings really live, which is that if their money that they make can't afford a house or an apartment, then they, then they often will do something to change that, which is get roommates. This is one that we all know, right? Anybody who's ever had roommates, that's economic sharing. Co-living, as, as it you know has been in the last few years, that's economic sharing, right? Um, you know, like congregate senior housing, right? You know, that's that's economic sharing, right? And then our youth urban townhouse is economic sharing, but for multi-gen families and roommates as appropriate, right? And so- that basically enables these people to afford a lifestyle. But what the interesting thing is on the formulaic side and why it makes money are like, let's say we're re, you're renting some recent units at 4,000 a month. Okay. So just simple math for a five bedroom unit, it's 4,000 a month. Well, that ends up being $800 per bedroom. Right. And that's actually how these families, we learned this as we toured around the families to, in a leasing conversation, they started to go, oh, uh, you know, um, grandma's going to be in that room and, and you know, from Social Security, she can pay X and, you know, mom and dad will be in that room and they're going to pay Y. And then, you know, adult child who's working, you know, at Starbucks, you know, they're going to afford that. And so what it ends up, the, the practical part of economic sharing is that they start to do this math, right? And then 800 bucks a month is very affordable in comparison to anything. If you went to rent a one bedroom in this market in Southern California, let's say I was just doing some research. You know, that's probably 2,000, 2,500, maybe 3,000 a month 
for ostensibly the same space. Now, one bedroom with a kitchen and a bathroom will be bigger than a bedroom. But if your thought process is, how do I figure out how to live affordably by sharing incomes and expenses with other people, then I don't want to afford the two bedroom or the, the one bedroom at 2000 or 2500 I'm going to find the unit if I can find it where I can rent a bedroom, still have, you know, kitchen and bathrooms and all the kind of stuff um, that, you know, enables me to go, live a good life, but I do it much more affordably. So the combination of those two things is cost efficiency and this high whole dollar gross rent at 4000 a month, which is still affordable to families because of economic sharing. When you put those two together, we have high whole dollar rent generation and really cost efficient build. So bringing you back to that formula of highest revenue at the lowest cost, which is, you know, the fundamental heart of making, you know, successful, feasible multifamily development deals. Scott, that's that's really insightful and, and brilliant. And I love the way you broke down the approach and how it works, because the thing that jumped out, you, you really had a couple things, but three things really stood out from what you said. One is this notion of economic sharing, which, um, you know, there's, we've seen the roommates, co-living, there, there are lots of different examples of that. Your focus is in multi-generational families mm -hmm. where this is a little less common because you typically don't have the space to have two, three different generations of one family living under one roof, unless it's, you know, a house that's been in the family for a long time. So yeah. that's very interesting. And I want to dig into that just a little bit more. And then the third thing you talked about, really that matrix, right, uh, or that ratio of, you know, your cost to build and then maximum income and understanding that there's a threshold of where you want to hit by focusing on this approach where for, for one unit, you're only, you know, you're putting five bedrooms in and one kitchen, but we know the kitchens are the most expensive things to put into any home, right? So yeah. if you can build one kitchen, you know, and have five bedrooms, which, you know, is pretty easy to build, right? I mean, that's pretty much as drywall, <laughs> carpets, you know, yeah. electric, right? that's pretty easy to build to add more bedrooms versus if you had to build five new kitchens, I mean, that could easily, you know, multiply your cost. So now you're starting to understand how you're able to get into this process and be very efficient without using government, you know, dollars or any kind of right. subsidies. You're able to do this and do it privately. Um, yeah. So one, one question for me is that, I know you're focusing on like uh, LA, we talked about Long Beach and, and markets like that. And you you met, you brought up co living and and that's what I've started to see arise in right and this this concept in co living but that's more roommates right individuals that's a little less Correct. family oriented yeah do you is there another distinction between co living than just you know the the target of who's living there um the 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 target is different um and I think there's some some effects of the, what the target shows up so obviously the target is young singles i've seen some young couples like i for a while i was having a pretty deep conversation with the guys at common uh in fact they were looking at some of our units maybe they wanted a master lease and we didn't end up doing a deal with them but i went toured one of their deals but what i noticed is um the areas where they developed were much higher end like higher end neighborhoods you know more expensive land higher rent areas but you know more expensive to build more expensive land um their finishes were really high end right i mean we're talking marble you know, marble countertops and, you know, beautiful wood flooring. I mean, you know, rooftop decks and beautiful, it's beautiful stuff. But I think where, where I come in is it's really on the, the financial model of co-living. So if I remember correctly, and this is going back a little bit in time, but they were charging $1,600 per bedroom, whether you were a single or a couple, like to get that room and the shared access of the kitchen and the facilities and the rooftop deck, you were paying 1600 bucks a month. So, uh, so I know those are all interrelated. It's sort of like, who's the demographic? What's their income? Where's the location where they live? And what's the product type? But at the end of the day, what made co-living so great as a financial model was the revenue. I remember, in fact, Common, when they first called me, they were like, hey, we can, we can boost your NOI by 40%. That was their sales pitch. And you know what? They were right. I looked at it. I was like, wow, man, this is like crazy. You know, this is really great. Um, where, where we couldn't get uh, comfort with it, and, and I'll just I'll finish here because I think I hope I answer your question, is, you know, if we went and did a deal with them, like they were going to take some of our five-bedroom units and turn them into co-living, which I thought, great idea. Our product type probably wasn't like the best fit, but locationally, we had some interesting locations for them. But my issue was if in three years or five years that Common or any co-living operator went bye-bye, 
right? They just, that model didn't work anymore. They went out of business, whatever. So while it was great to get the 40% uptick in NOI, I was like, what happens with if that goes away? So I've underwritten my deal and I've got all these cash flow things set up. And I mean, it was like cash flow, like a freight train. But if that went away, now you're back to, okay, well, what was the original deal, which for us still worked, but I, I didn't want to like make that bet and then, and then take the bet and then have the bet reverse on me. And that wasn't anything to do with common. I mean, the people were real smart and, you know, good business plan. I think co-living to me has turned out to be probably not the end all be all that I think everything, everybody thought it would be, you know, I don't see it as a, as a growing market, but I, quite honestly, John, I'm like totally not tracking it. So I may be wrong. Um, but I, th I just, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't get comfortable with it as a sustainable financial model. And so I needed to, if I was going to have investors in my deal and we're all going to benefit from it, that's great. But I had to take into account the possible downside of it. So anyways, that, as an investor, that makes sense, right? Because ultimately you're making, you're making decisions on behalf of those investors and it's hard to make projections on things you yeah. can't control, right? You I mean, it's really nice to tell them we're going to make all this extra money, <laughs> but I never want to tell them, oh, by the way, right. that went away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now exactly. we're back to, you know, something still good, but you know, it was just an outsized financial return which is attractive but you know when you looked at the reversal of it you know it was a good return uh but you know it's like just a lot of volatility well and, and i think as investors that's one of the things you always want to caution right i mean there's nothing wrong with getting an outsized return and we see that with short-term rentals right we have yeah. people own apartments and maybe they would have convert a couple to short-term rentals there's nothing wrong with that but if you're modeling and you're banking everything on that and that goes away that's where you leave yourself a little bit exposed. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. The banking part, that that was a critical yeah. part of it. Like, you know, you didn't want to make that loan sizing bet on the higher right. NOI and then have that reverse on you. So, Scott, we talked about being in like South, you know, South L.A. Uh, with the, your model, which makes a lot of sense. And out there in the West where, again, cost of living is certainly much higher than other parts of the country. Do you think? Is that kind of a, a linchpin to this model? If we had folks in, say, for instance, the Midwest who were like, hey, I love this. You know, I'd love to build some workforce housing and maybe I'd want to do something along these lines. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's potential there or does it is it really rele relegated to kind of these, these higher cost to live markets? I think it works best in those high cost markets. I mean, UTH is a is a like creation of the California marketplace, right? Just like, you know, I've spent my entire career here. I've worked in affordable housing. I worked in market rate housing. So sort of all those ingredients that sort of came together organically into this thing as a solution to the wage uh, gap and rent gap that we have in California, which we know is the worst of any state in the United States, right? And hence the creation of it here. Um, but no, I, I think it certainly it works in any major metro coastal market. Um, you, we have underwritten some, some markets like think like Dallas, I think there's a story there. I think the, the nature of it changes. I think the fundamental part of like sort of the multiple bedroom, you know, multi-gen, you know, sort of workforce housing model, I think is still there fundamentally, but the nature of it changes. So like, as an example, when we went to go on right Dallas, we, um, we, we talked to property managers, you know, as one of the people we do, we go, Hey, we're going to do this product. What do you think? Or we're thinking about it. And it was interesting because they said, well, look, families, if they live in Dallas, they would choose to just drive 20 minutes and they would have, you know, really cheaper housing than what you're providing and probably even a house. Right. And my method, my mentality is always if a family had a choice to rent a house versus a attached unit, even though we got this great townhouse, um, you know, that would that should that would be the choice. That'd be the logical choice that they make. Right. But what was interesting is we died into the research and what particularly attracted me to Dallas was. When I was in Dallas, I, I toured through different parts of the city, and there's a part of Dallas called Old East Dallas. It's sort of a little bit south and east of downtown, like right next to downtown. And there's a bunch of town three-story townhouse projects being built like all over the place, man. Little infill, three and 10 and 15, 20 unit projects. They were all three-story townhouse with a two-car garage, exactly like our product. But here's the interesting thing. They were all two bedrooms, they were very large, like 2,100 square feet, if I remember correctly. And what dawned on me is that some of the people had bought these units as a condo, but then put them on the rental marketplace. They were renting them for 3,500 bucks a month. Well, that happened to be at the time that we were underwriting what we, we were charging a five bedroom in California was 3,500 bucks a month. So I'm like, huh, this is weird. I can just build a two bedroom unit and charge the same rent. 
something's going on there. And so, it, you know, the unit was much bigger. It was two bedrooms officially, but in the Dallas zoning code, parking was an issue and you don't have sort of the, or you didn't have at the time, they have it now, like a density bonus where you can reduce parking. So it was two cars in the garage, two bedrooms. That was the, that was the model, mm -hmm. right? And so if you went to three bedrooms, you had to have three cars or some such thing. And so nobody built that, right? Logically. They just want to fit in the zoning. But what they did do is it gave you a big den and a big bonus room and a loft and a, you know, this and that, right? The units were giant, 2,100 square feet, at least compared to how we did it. So that was an interesting model. And I think we were going to, we were going to fit in there. This happened to be in like January and February of 2020. And so COVID came and we just like, we're like, you know, like no expansion, even no thought of expansion. And in fact, locally here in California, we just, we didn't take on any more new big projects. We took on a couple of really strategic, super local, like in our backyard projects that were well-priced land and that kind of things. Um, in fact, those are just, you know, a couple of them just, you know, finished last year. So, uh, but, but the bottom line is maybe some slight tweak in the product type would be a fit. And then I'll end here. What, when talking to property managers, what they said, oh, they go, oh yeah, that two bedroom product, that's great roommate product. It wasn't families so much. It was young urban professionals who maybe worked in downtown Dallas. They didn't want to drive very far. Old East Dallas sort of had some cool stuff going on in it from a gentrification, you know, sort of like retail and, you know, music venues and, you know, bars and breweries, that kind of thing. That stuff was going on. So I think that's probably where we would have gone. So, but then we have to think about what's our mission? Our, is our mission to serve, you know, younger professionals? I mean, we serve younger professionals now, like roommate groups are the same. This happened to be a five bedroom roommate instead of two bedroom. So I think there's a national story for urban townhouse, our product type. Um, and in fact, our equity fund, we're working on our second equity fund is intended to expand. We'll be expanding throughout California. So we'll be SoCal where we're focused our headquarters in now, um, but we just made the move up into the Bay area and we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the same kind of neighborhoods that we do in the Bay area that we do in SoCal, which is your sort of B and C working class neighborhood where we're building this brand new A product with, you know, five bedroom, you know, units and a three-story townhouse with a two-car garage. We're going to do the exact same version, but we'll do it up in the, you know, what I describe as the Inland Empire of the Bay Area. Because again, we're looking for places where rents are high and incomes are, you know, not keeping up with the rents. Bay Area is, you know, as, as, as a radical example of that. Um, as it is in Southern California. And then after that, you know, probably I think Texas would be next. Uh, I'll, I'll finish here. My, you know, we, you, you alluded to it before. California has a just pretty insane regulatory, you know, environment, you know, politically and, and from a regulatory standpoint, not particularly business friendly or landlord friendly. So I think there's a story for us in the long run. You continue to be a capital platform fund manager, focus on workforce housing. But I think, you know, we'll start to look at out of state, you know, think like, you know, Texas, Florida, North Carolina, both from an acquisition standpoint. So acquiring existing workforce housing assets, like some people are doing now, we don't do that presently. Um, and then in a parallel, since we're setting up offices and expansion, then we'll start to take on strategic, you know, well underwritten, you know, new housing projects in those same markets. Um, and then, you know, not that we'll ever leave California totally, but we'll just try to be really strategic about how we build and how long we hold um, new product in California. Like I won't buy anything existing in California because of the, you know, landlord unfriendly laws, but I can build new housing. Our UTH is all exempt from rent control. At least, you know, now presently it's anything post 1978 is exempt from rent control. Um, and then there's some new referendums that are floating around that haven't passed yet, but they will, that'll make it a rolling 15 year period. So whenever you build your new housing and you get your certificate of occupancy 15 years later from that date, it then becomes rent controlled. So from our standpoint, strategically, we would just build within that, you know, 15 year cycle and, you know, ostensibly having sold out, you know, well before that 15 year rolling period, that's not in effect yet, but the last referendum that died, that was going to change rent control had that provision in it. Um, I, I hope the politicians in California are not, stupid enough to put rent control on brand new housing like they did in Minneapolis and St. Paul, where they basically wiped out their entire inventory of new housing projects because rent control applied from day one. Um, I'm hoping they'll, you know, keep some sanity 
uh, but we have to be, you know, vigilant around these sort of regulatory changes and, you know, just adjust. We like California. We think we're good at it. We are good at it. Um, we'll keep making money here and, and serving families. Um, but we, you know, think in big picture national footprint eventually. Scott, I love that you came back to your focus and your mission, you know, serving families, understanding the need for housing that, you know, really bridges the gap between affordable, you know, those folks who really need it versus luxury and really understanding that workforce housing sentiment and then being in a place that has, you know, it, you know, notoriously been known as a difficult place to do business, <laughs> hard to develop, has a lot yeah. of loopholes and regulations, but you found a path to solve all those problems with your mm -hmm. urban townhome development. So I love that. For our listeners who want to learn more, they can check out your newsletter, the Real Signal newsletter. We're going to put a link to that in our show notes. Right now, we're going to transition and go to our round of insights. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Um, so the one, you know, like my my answer for that is, you know, going through 2008, going through, you know, the, the real estate recession 2008. Um, basically, the lesson I learned is don't be cocky. Uh, don't be overconfident, um, you know, listen for the signals. In fact, the reason I call the newsletter the real signal is a, is a testament, uh, a reminder for myself to continue to pay attention to the real signals in the economy. And what I mean by real is not BS, not some economist who's getting paid to say stuff or a writer who writes for a newspaper or a magazine or, you know, a blog that would be these days. Um, it's to really continue to look for. In fact, this is the two parts of the newsletter, workforce housing and investment and, and, and underwriting opportunities, investing in those, and then also real estate macro. The real estate macro is this, is that basically looking for the real signal, what's really going on so I can use it to make sure that I'm adjusting my business plan appropriately. So had I been paid attention to the real signal and started to see it like 2004, 2005, I could have shut down a whole bunch of projects, John, and you know just you know sort of camped out through 2008 you know through 2012 i could have you know gone to the beach in the bahamas or something like that i would never do that but you know you know what i mean and others you could avoid you know the the sort of the fight we had to go through to save a bunch of projects and you know we saved you know virtually all of them but man it was tough so we we carry that lesson forward you know most importantly evidenced by this newsletter that we write Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. So I track a lot of different um, websites. So um, let's see. Uh, it's a great question. I got a, I got a lot. Um, so there's a guy named Bill McBride who writes a blog. You can just you know type in Bill McBride blog. And I really like his stuff because he's basically, he's not an economist in a formal sense, but he writes about things. He's sort of like a retired Fortune 500 executive guy. So he sort of has the philosophy that I hold. In fact, my philosophy that I describe comes a lot from what he does. And so he's just looking at signals dispassionately. He doesn't call them signals, but he's got different economic, you know, things that he tracks. He does beautiful graphing and he's a sort of a housing centric guy. So I like to follow him. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've been heavy on YouTube r lately. I so I walk. I try to do between ten and fifteen thousand steps every day, and so that has me on the road around my house. You know, somewhere between an hour and two hours every day. I usually split it up in the morning and evenings. And I've been going, you know, hard on YouTube. And I don't have any particularly go-to, um, you know, places. Um, Lex Friedman has a good podcast. Um, that's a pretty long form podcast. So you got to, you know, you got to listen through a lot of its stuff. There's an interesting um, website called Savvy Finance. It's pretty good. It, it's a little cheesy, but the people who run it, you know, they do get a pretty good job sort of highlighting, you know, they're very sort of Bitcoin, um, you know, new technology oriented. They're, so they're not real estate. Really fundamentally the way I think of it, John, I really try not to listen to too much real estate stuff, right? I want to find stuff that's tech, that's technology, that's robotics, that's AI, that's, you know, um, went, went down deep rabbit hole on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Um, some, some great stuff. A uh, uh, great book called The Bitcoin Standard by Safadina Amis. Uh, definitely read that. Um, there's a guy named Balaji Srinivasan. Um, pretty, you know, if you just, Balaji, just look him up on YouTube. 
Uh, he wrote a, a book called The Network State. So some really forward thinking around sort of economic freedom, decentralized, you know, currencies, i.e. Bitcoin, not, not other crypto, Bitcoin specifically. Uh, but the idea that we'll start to form new networks, new states that are not geographically based because I was born in California in America. And so the, these lines are where I live. It's that, hey, I have an interest in Bitcoin economies and the guy across the world, he has an interest in it and that gal over there has it. Now we can form a new state, a network state, not a physical state. Um, so I know I'm getting on the weeds a little bit here, but you know, that's sort of, I, I travel that space a lot. And I'm really always looking for, in fact, in the newsletter, I, I do share a lot of economic signals, but I'm always trying to salt stuff in there that's totally off the, you know, off the beaten path of real estate. Um, for better or worse, real estate is a pretty old school, you know, industry as far as like the use of tech. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are running at tech and real estate. Um, not many people doing really justice to it. Um, but I want to pull from all kinds of different other influences. You know, Lex Friedman just had a podcast with Bill Ackman, you know, and we've all been seeing Bill Ackman on, on X and, you know, his whole thing with, you know, Harvard and all that kind of stuff. But I was listening to him sort of, you know, talk about his sort of old school Ben Graham style of investing, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Warren Buffett and his methodology for doing investing away. But I was really starting to think about it. I go, oh, these are some great ways we can think about value investing, but apply to real estate, right? So he talked about the difference between price and value, a la Ben Graham. And I go, oh, our, our UTH housing is that, right? We're producing more value than the price of that asset. And so therefore, you know, we're not a publicly traded company. We're not a stock, you know, we're not like that kind of financial instrument. But I start to think about how can we apply these sort of thought processes to real estate, at least so that I can be a better operator, developer, capital manager, capital allocator, um, and you know make money for my investors, make money for us, and serve our families. You were talking about some books. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Um, not spe any specific one. The Bitcoin Standard. I would definitely recommend that. And and that and so people before they react, it's a lot about money and not Bitcoin. But the whole financial, you know, world, the world of money and currency going back into, you know, ancient medieval times and how humans and money operate together and how societies and cultures build and fall related to, you know, how money works. Think like Roman Empire and the, you know, the diminution of their, their currency, like the dilution of their currency, inflation, right? Um, let's see what else. Um, I love the book, The One Thing. It's a little bit old school, um, but you know, the, the, what, what Gary Keller wrote about that focus, you know, I've been spending a lot of time like reading about focus. I'm always working on trying to, you know, stay more focused, refocus, um, build our strategic plan for our company so that we can, you know, we are focused on workforce housing in this UTH model, but how can I get everything in our team, everyone rowing the right way? Um, so those would be probably two books I'd recommend more recently. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Uh, my walking, my, my Walks, 10 plus yeah. thousand steps is really key. I mean, it's not, you know, people will, will they'll beat up on a little bit. Oh, that's not real exercise. And I would agree with them. It's not, you know, zone two cardio. It's not lifting weights and you need to do those two. Uh, but for me, so I walk, you know, 10,000 steps, you know, in the, in the, in the morning. And then I try to get the other five in the evening when I'm doing that. But it basically, several things. One, it gets me out in the sunshine. Like I purposely, you know, take my hat off and I don't wear sunglasses to get, you know, sunshine in my eyeballs, on my skin. That's good for 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 health, but also mood is an insane. Walking, I can leave the house, John, and be in the worst mood, worst mood. And I can pretty much guarantee 99 out of 100 times I will come back after an hour of walking and I will feel great. Like I'll just, you know, all the stuff that was basically you know weighing on me you know you got to still come back and deal with you know the normal problems problem solving that we do in the real estate development business but you got you know sunshine you got fresh air breeze um, blue sky i i'm sort of of the mind that you know the human eyeball really needs to see green things like trees because when we were caveman we walked through the forest and you know went and got food and hunted and all that stuff um but i think there's a there's a certain you know, mental health, physical health, 
thing that comes from movement, moving, walking is my thing, um, but all these other sort of environmental influences. You know, now when the sun's not out and it's cloudy, you know, it's not as fun, um, but I still do the walks. But, you know, like this morning I went out and the sun was shining. It was, it was beautiful. Give me your number one insight for, we're going to call it uh, town home, urban town home development. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the insight that I would share is that I think this is a totally forgotten, it's not missing, like the missing middle like we talked about. In fact, a, a member of my team came up with the term forgotten middle, which is that this there's a whole universe of people that are these middle income working class families that are under pressure from rent increases, uh, stagnant wages and inflation that the development and real estate industries, the finance industries have totally missed. And so the insight is that these people exist. Um, they're there. They're a giant market. Um, they they want to live a good life. They're aspirational. They're gonna they're gonna you know work to take care of their families, including choosing you know better housing that helps them good live a good life affordably. And so the insight is that there's a whole universe of these people throughout the United States. I won't even call them the middle class because I don't know if the middle class in the way we think of it traditionally really exists. But these are like working class, middle income families, salt of the earth, family oriented. They want to take care of their families. They want to live a good life. They don't want to be, you know, under pressure and, you know, getting behind the eight ball from a, from a you know, a money and, and affordability standpoint. And so the inside is that there's a huge market to serve that we can both, you know, serve families, you know, doing well and also make money doing it because we need to stay alive. We need to stay profitable. Like we got to, you know, continue and sustain the model and make our investors money. So I think the insight is that that is a totally unknown, forgotten or misperceived area of the marketplace that, you know, nobody's really paying attention to. Great information there. We're going to go with the light question for the last one. Uh, you are still in South, uh, South California, right? Yeah, I'm in a city called Long Beach at the south end of LA. Long Beach, all right. Yeah. Right. So you're in Long Beach. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, so locally here in Long Beach, there's a place called Joe Jost's. It's J-O-S-T-S, Joe Jost's. And it's this place that started in the early 20s as a haircut place, like the old school barber shop, right? And, uh, you know, sort of post-prohibition became like a beer hall for all intents and purposes. And it's a place that my family has been going for like generations now, literally. Uh, my kids are fourth generation of Long Beach. So when you go there, you got to get a schooner of beer. It's a big old goblet of beer. Um, you know, it used to be Paps Blue Ribbon, but they stopped serving that. But you go real old school beer and then you get a special and pickled eggs. Got to love gotta, it, man. It, it's totally <laughs> hole in the wall, John. If Like if you drove by it, you'd miss it. But when you get inside, <laughs> like I take people there purposely, they're like, wow, dude, I didn't know this existed. So you got to hit JoJo's. I love it, man. Listen, I love Scott just listening to your story, you know, starting really with, you know, your, 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 your family, you know, just, you know, mentioned this fourth generation now, as far as your kids and uh, being in the real estate industry and, you know, looking at it differently and for you carving out your own niche, your own niche in this space and focusing on, you know, urban infill development and now focusing on workforce housing, understanding why there is an opportunity, all the challenges you had to overcome and, and navigate through. And really this, this untapped opportunity, these folks who, you know, forgotten middle, as you called it, you know, so coming up with a solution for these individuals. I think there's a lot of great information there. Uh, again, for folks who do want to learn more about you, the company and how they can get involved, uh, check out the Real Signal newsletter. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. Scott, yeah. I just want to thank you again for being a great guest and coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.